Okay, well, welcome everyone to session six of Everywhere It Is Machines, our postgraduate research series at Royal Holloway. Um, first of all, a big thank you to Lily for leading this series and for allowing us to organize these events. Um, can I just remind everyone to please keep your microphones muted until the Q&A. If you have a question after the presentation, um, you can just say so in the chat and, and then we'll, you're, you're free to unmute yourself and ask a question yourself. Um, my name is Lucia, by the way. I'm a PhD music student at Royal Holloway. And it is my pleasure to introduce William O'Hara, who is our speaker today. He is assistant professor of music at Gettysburg College and he earned his PhD at Harvard University. He's also taught at Tufts University. His interests include music in contemporary digital media, in video games and social media, music analysis, and the intellectual history of music theory. He has chapters for the coming in the Oxford Handbook of Public Music Theory and the Oxford Handbook of Sound and Music in Video Games. And the reason I got to know his work is that I read his article um, on the cultural politics of music theory in online discourse, which won the 2020 Alan Chris uh, Award from the Society of Music Theory's Popular Music Interest Group. Um, so welcome, William, and thank you very much for being here. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you everyone for, uh, for having me. Thanks Lucia for all your uh, hard work coordinating the talk. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is, is uh, a bit of a new, uh, not a new subject for me, but uh, new work on a subject that I've explored a bit. So it builds uh, on the article that Lucia mentioned on the, the cultural politics of online music analysis. There I was thinking primarily in print. Here I'm gonna be looking at a couple of different uh, mediums for doing music theory. I'd like to talk today about the internet as an instrument, as a tool for making music and for doing music theory. Now a full account of that would of course be a sprawling unimaginable project. So tonight I'm going to focus on one small slice at the intersection of musical performance, production, circulation, and theorization. In this study, I've been particularly inspired by Alexander Redding's concept of an instrument of music theory. In one of, one of a paired set of 2016 essays on the topic Reading writes, let's make sure I can see my PowerPoint here. Reading writes, quote, music theorists do well to take musical instruments seriously. They are embodiments of theoretical ideas about music. All musical instruments carry theoretical properties and it can be instructive to consider them in terms of what they can tell us on a more abstract level. In the other essay, he lays the stakes out even more clearly, quote, musical instruments simultaneously generate musical sounds and knowledge about music. Now, Redding's intention is to render visible the ways in which the background furniture, so to speak, of Western music theory have shaped our concepts and approaches, and to offer ways in which our established intellectual histories might have gone differently had other metaphors for musicking, such as the monochord or the siren, taken root. He brings to bear a key insight from the history of science that instruments, whether scientific or musical, shape our modes of inquiry, whether by making certain kinds of activities possible or by reflecting in their design and construction some body of theoretical knowledge. Redding's investigation considers several paradigmatic instruments of music theory, each of which are recognizable for their musical features, but also for the way in which they embody music theories. I'll introduce one of them very briefly so you can have an overview of one uh, general example. The Archicembalo was a 31 key harpsichord designed by the composer and music theorist Nicola Vicentino, who lived from 1511 to 1576. Vicentino proposed a system of tuning that divided the octave into 31 equal tones instead of the 12 tones we generally employ today. As you see here in a diagram by John Wilde, Vicentino's system places as many as four notes in the middle of a whole step indicated through both distinct names and dots. 12 tone equal temperament by contrast would locate only a single tone in the middle, a note that could be called D sharp or E flat interchangeably. Not surprisingly, this system was extremely- I'm really sorry to interrupt William. I'm just not sure, um, we're not seeing any PowerPoint. Ah. So just, just that I would let yes. you know, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. I couldn't see the chat either. Yes, I, uh, 
I started the PowerPoint and I didn't share my screen. You'd think after, uh, after 15 months or so, I would have learned. All right, let's find this. Thank you so much for speaking up. There we are. Yep. I was going to say, normally I could see the faces above the PowerPoint as well. Yeah, we can see. We can see. That's great. So there's the there's the diagram. There's the instrument itself, and a little schematic of how its keys are put together. So as you see here. The otherwise traditional keyboard is divided into numerous keys in order to articulate the pitches that fall in between those of the standard layout. The instrument is both an embodiment of Vicentino's theory and a tool for putting it into practice, whether for hearing 31 tone music for oneself or helping singers to perform it. Now in my talk today, I would like to expand upon Redding's provocative and useful account of music theoretical instruments and bring it into contact with three important forms of music making and music theorizing online. I'd like to think about what might constitute a 21st century music theoretical instrument by looking to the many affordances provided by electronic instruments, software, and contemporary production techniques. I would also like to situate these instruments within their larger context, several aesthetic trends and modes of circulation and virality that characterize the social and participatory media in which we have all become increasingly enmeshed. Redding's concept of the music theoretical instrument offers us numerous ways of thinking about music making and music theorizing in online media. Let's begin by summarizing a few of his conclusions. First, music theoretical instruments rely on a numerical or scientific conception of sound. This conception, Redding writes, is usefully distant from many contemporary models of theory and analysis, and this distance should sensitize us to subtle aspects of music and sound. Music theoretical instruments also tend to arise when the limits of human performers are reached. The archicembalo, for instance, the 31 key harpsichord, was designed to make subtle variations in tuning audible and performable for singers who could scarcely make the distinctions called for in the theory. Finally, he writes, we would do well to think carefully about the relationships between music theoretical instruments and the theories that they represent or with which they are associated. In much the same way as theories do not always match perfectly with contemporaneous musical repertoires, neither do the instruments of music theory bear a transparent relationship to the figures or concepts with which they're often associated. A music theoretical instrument might be, in terms borrowed from the philosopher Gaston Bachelard, a materialized theory, an object that embodies a particular approach to music and sound. The archicembalo, in our case, would be a perfect example of this, in that the instrument is built to reflect the theory of 31 tone equal temperament, and its existence makes the demonstration and exploration of that system more attainable. Or an instrument might be what historian of science Hans-Jörg Reinberger calls an epistemic thing, an assemblage or network from which music theoretical knowledge can emerge. For more on this, I'll refer you to Redding's 2016 article in Music Theory Online, where you can read all about some other examples, uh, particularly the Rhythmicon from, from Harry Parch, which brings together rhythm and pitch, a theory of the unity of rhythm and pitch with the existing technology of the siren in a manner that both reflected a theory and led to further compositional development. Now, throughout my talk, I'm gonna propose a few trends that I see as central to the operation of 21st century music theoretical instruments. In fact, my first case study will demonstrate the first takeaway from a study. They closely, that 21st century musical theoretical instruments closely straddle the line between theory and performance. Now, this is not entirely new in the sense that this relationship obtains with historical instruments as well. The archicembalo could be used to accompany a choir and of course, one of the most common contemporary tools for music theory, the piano, is far more familiar to us as an instrument of performance rather than theoretical inquiry. But in the first segment of my talk, I'd like to propose that music theoretical insight comes from a close marriage of instrumental and analytical understanding. Let's begin with a video. This is a clip of a guitarist named Luca Stricagnoli performing Michael Jackson's Thriller. On his YouTube channel, which is full of performances like this one, Stricagnoli often plays two guitars at once, a feat which is made possible by careful musical arrangement, instrument modification, and various extended performance techniques. 
In this video, he wears one guitar in a conventional way and places the other horizontally on a table. Generally, he performs the bass line with his left hand on the guitar that he holds and performs the melody on the tabletop guitar, which has been retuned in order to make that possible. Uh, I realize I've made another, there we go. Just checking to ensure that I had sound. And here we are. So there are several things to note about this performance. The first is the one-handed rendition of Thriller's memorable bass line, as shown here. Using a combination of hammer-ons, pull-offs, and left-handed plucking, he's able to perform the bass line with only one hand on the guitar that he holds traditionally. As the entire bass line falls within a single hand position at the end of the neck, the proper position can easily be found by feeling at each chorus to verse transition leaving Stricanioli free to attend to the tabletop guitar. Another important aspect is the demonstration that the melody from Thriller's verse contains only six notes, precisely as many as a standard guitar has strings. This makes it possible to perform the verse using only retuned open strings. Now, one thread that ties this video together with many other solo arrangement performances on YouTube is this convenient mapping of musical structure onto instrumental design. In this case, both of Thriller's distinct parts can be performed with a single hand, left hand on the standard guitar, with some challenging but not unusual techniques, and the right hand through a far less conventional retuned guitar laid on the table. It's been tuned in diatonic steps to give us the six notes of the verse. The tabletop guitar also has a piece of plastic attached to it on which Stricanioli taps the backbeat on his thumb in between melodic notes. For each chorus and bridge, finally, Stricanioli plays the first guitar two-handed in the standard way. His polyphonic left hand marks him as classically trained as he now performs both melody and harmony clearly. Now, I'm not prepared to speculate about precisely how he might have come to the realization that he could perform this song this way, but I believe it must reflect a close study of the song, what we would think of as music analysis. There may have been trial and error involved, or Stricanioli may have realized that he could perform one hand or the other, maybe the bass line, and he could have gone looking for ways to execute the other part with a single hand as well. Perhaps one serendipitous discovery followed the other. If we are thinking about instruments of music theory and how they might embody theoretical ideas, Stricanioli's dual guitars make an interesting case study. The guitar itself is usually tuned in fourths with a major third on the second highest string. This makes certain fingerings both simpler and more comfortable. Now, recent scholarly approaches to alternate guitar tunings tend to emphasize the possibilities that they open up for performers and songwriters. Some tunings make it easier <clears throat> to play basic chords by making possible a standard hand shape that can simply be moved around the fretboard. Peter Kaminsky and Megan Lyons analyzed the, the use of alternate tunings in the music of Joni Mitchell, for example who in interviews has discussed retuning her guitar in search of new sounds and in compensation for her left hand's reduced range of motion due to a childhood case of polio. Now, examining the work of jazz guitarist Kurt Rosenwinkel, another theorist, Jonathan D'Souza, has noted that alternate tunings might productively force a performer or improviser into new musical patterns by disrupting the well-learned convention connections between physical gesture and sonic result. Quote, one twist of a tuning peg can turn you into a beginner in an instant, writes Christian Rover, 
referring to these alternate tunings as voluntary self-sabotage. In the performance discussed here, however, the retuned open strings of Strickagnoli's guitar have a very different effect than do the alternate tunings of a conventionally played guitar. Recall, due to his unusual technique, only the six open strings are available. Therefore, rather than creating new affordances, perhaps, or engendering fresh awareness due to unexpected interstring intervals, Strickagnoli's tabletop guitar retuning effectively turns the instrument into a bespoke single-use tool best suited for executing one song only, a theoretical instrument bound up with Thriller's harmonic and melodic structure. This retuning is clear evidence of time spent actively analyzing this and likely many other songs, exploring them, perhaps auditioning them for suitability to this style of cover. A second example can show another very close match between song structure and performance technique. Kavehi is an independent singer-songwriter based in Lawrence, Kansas. She's been active on YouTube since 2013. Her videos are technically and musically creative, chronicling her solo performances of both cover and original songs. Some of Kavehi's performances take advantage of multi-track recording, while most of them employ live looping technology. Live looping is a practice in which short segments of music are recorded and then played back so that a musician may accompany themselves. Long and analog practice associated with performance artists like Laurie Anderson and dependent on literal tape loops before the invention of digital looping devices in the 1990s, live looping is now very popular among indie musicians on YouTube, driven either by floor pedals or by software, as in this case, Ableton Live. Kavehi's equipment, shown here, is integral to both her performances and her online persona. This image is from her Instagram account. It depicts the arrangement that we're about to see and hear in performance, a cover of Nirvana's heart-shaped box. I'll play for about a minute. Yep, 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 yep. Is this thing on? Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah! Uh. It's a bit ironic that I'm fading the video out as the song proper begins, but it's the introduction that I really want to talk about. As the video gets underway, we get nearly two minutes of Kavehi recording and looping musical fragments, keyboard drones, synthesized guitar riffs, backing vocals, beatboxing. The very beginning finds her demonstrating the tool that will underlie much of her performance, the voice live touch processor, which harmonizes any pitch that she sings with a deep bass tone and a piquant minor third. As shown here, she uses this processor to record two simple vocal loops. One for the chorus is a single pitch 
A, which is then harmonized with the minor third above and an octave below. The other, shown here, goes A to F. This is then harmonized with C and A above and the original vocal pitch is an octave lower. Now, Kavehi triggers these sampled dyads throughout the song's primary three chord progression, which she slowly then fleshes out with synthesizer parts. As we've seen and heard, she recorded numerous fragments from the song, and she does so in a very careful order. For instance, the post-chorus loop, which comes last in the song structure, is recorded first so that she can then come back around to it at the end in order to lead smoothly into the first verse. Even the introduction then, what we might think of as before the beginning, is very carefully structured. Many of its distinctive portions, the guitar riff, which will double the vocals, or the shout that begins the video, are recorded early and seemingly forgotten about until later. From the end of the introductory chorus, Kavehi speak, steps seamlessly into the first verse. Now, I think it's useful to think about Kavehi's looped vocals as a kind of analytical demonstration of the role that common tones play in triadic harmony. The AC dyad is effective at knitting heart-shaped box together. That is, it makes this performance possible because of the song's third related chord progression, A minor, F major, D7. A and C participate in each of these chords, recontextualized by the bass line. That dyad is only silenced when the harmony changes at the end of the chorus, but these fit neatly into the song's harmonic structure as well. Kavehi's minimal arrangement clearly takes advantage of the role played by minor thirds in each of these three chords. She can sing so few notes because the AC dyad participates in all three of them, and the moving line from A down to F sharp participates in the last two. In other words, the performance is made possible by its clever expression of the song's harmonic structure in only a few notes. Kavehi's video also sensitizes the listener to the various parts of the song and how they go together. Recording the parts of the track in advance has almost the effect of a musician's stage show. Here are the metal rings. Yes, they're solid, but you won't believe what I'm going to do with them next. As I've argued in a previous talk and essay, I believe that minimalist solo cover videos like these can be read as music analytical texts, revealing insights about song structures and demonstrating those structures to listeners in novel ways. One of the things that makes these videos feel almost discursive is the fact that over the five or so years since solo covers have risen to great popularity on YouTube, they've crystallized into a clearly defined genre that has distinct visual and musical rhetoric. As Carol Vernalis has argued about virality on YouTube in general, repetition plays a key role. It structures YouTube clips themselves. It describes the idealized user behavior, clicking from one clip to the next. And it even presents a unified visual field as individual video creators seek to situate, situate themselves within emerging trends and the evolving tastes of a digital audience. Now, I've been arguing that solo videos can serve as de facto analyses of songs. They begin with the artist's own analysis of a song, which is then staged in some gradual construction of loops. I'd like to shift the frame of reference now to one of the actual production tools that underlie videos like Kavehi. For our second case study, we'll look at digital audio workstations, or DAWs. These are pieces of software devoted to music production. And they range from very simple interfaces like GarageBand, which comes for free on Macintosh computers, up to very complicated, expensive professional packages like Ableton and Pro Tools. DAWs are used at every level of audio production, from radio and podcasts, to independent producers, to professionals in pop, hip hop, EDM, and so forth. They have a lot of potential as musical tools and a lot of potential as music theoretical instruments as well. As an initial introduction, I'd like to note that these software platforms meant for music production have great potential as pedagogical and analytical tools. In this video created just a few days ago, and too perfect to omit from the talk, Ethan Hine has paired a deconstruction of Angela Hewitt's performance of Bach's Art of Fugue with color-coded entries, formal labels, and harmonic analysis from Dennis Collins's analysis of the same piece. I'll play in just a moment.
that the visual style and the copious annotation tools included in most digital audio workstations are ideal for analyzing music. There are, of course, other ways of doing analysis in this mode using software like Sonic Visualizer, and the whole endeavor is worthy of further study. But what I'd like to zoom in on today is the potential of DAWs to shape and reflect the conceptions of musical structure that are held by the musicians who use them as creative tools through the peaks behind the curtain that are offered with increasing frequency by those practitioners on YouTube. I'm going to start with a clip from the British musician and YouTube personality, Jacob Collier, who's well known both for his dazzling arrangements and solo performances and for creating logic session breakdowns of some of his recordings. Logic is his DAW. In the following clip, which is a live recording of a session from early in the pandemic, Collier is constructing a cover of the Beatles' Hey Jude from the ground up. I'll play a moment from the beginning. So, so you know what I can do? It's about 70 BPM. Like this. That's about right. Now let, let's, let's think in layers for a second. So Hey Jude is a fairly simple song harmonically. Um, it, it, does, it doesn't go too far, um, but it's nice, I think, as a creative person to think about the edges and think about the decoration. And I, for one, often think about the, the decoration before I think about the, the cake, which is sometimes to my benefit, sometimes to my dismay or to my detriment. Um, but uh, if, we, if we sing the melody for one second, to, if you can sing at home if you want to on mute, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing. The I'm going to skip ahead just a moment to when he's already sung. This. Let's start with the bass. Hey, don't make it. Don't take a sad song and make it. Not bad. Hey, okay. So what we've just heard is that at the beginning of this video, Collier articulates a useful philosophy of music production. Um, he talks about decorating a cake. He talks about the core of the cake and the edges of the decoration. He records the vocal melody, and then he says, let's decorate this, and he adds a bass line. So from a traditional music theory standpoint, there's an immediate surprise here. Decorating the vocal melody with the bass line, he says. In most conceptions of music theory, whether concerned with the classical tradition or popular music, we might cast the bass line as a very central element in the construction of a song. It's the bottom layer of the cake, so to speak, to borrow Collier's metaphor. It's not the decoration. It's what holds the other layers up. But for Collier, it's part of a much wider texture that he'll soon build up with what he refers to as pyramids of notes, arpeggios that outline the harmonies. The vocal line is the central pillar of the song then, according to Collier's organization of the track, a revelation that will not be new to pop music scholars. Let's put another video on the table before we start to analyze this one further. The second example is by the independent producer Ruff, who in the spirit of full disclosure is a student of mine, although I didn't work with him on this video or in this track. Now in a 25 minute tutorial, he gives a live tour of one of his recent songs produced remotely during lockdown. Like Collier's demonstration, this unfolds completely inside the interface of his DAW, which this time is Ableton. The first thing to point out is that in this video, there's very little discussion of harmony and rhythm. Instead, Ruff presents a view of music production that is centered on the creation of a distinctive dynamic sonic environment. Oops. He speaks, for example, of using cafe ambiance tracks in the background of nearly all of his productions, arguing without these atmospheric elements, the track is really kind of closed. He also speaks frequently of elements that ensure a track is exciting, like speeding the tempo up almost imperceptibly. Finally, he conceives of sonic space broadly, both in terms of high and low pitch register and simultaneously in terms of the spatial characteristics of studio sound. The former is a very common concern for music theory, but the latter is mostly absent from analysis with some very recent exceptions. Ruff narrates, I typically have four orchestral sounds. I'll have one in the low octave that's pretty mono. I'll do one in the high mid that will shift to the right in the stereo field. One I'll shift to the left. And then a really high octave I'll put really wide. So what's interesting about DAWs in general is the way that they reflect 
numerous well-established metaphors for musical organization, yet they also make space for new ones, as we've just seen. The vertical arrangement of tracks, for instance, mirrors an orchestral score, and many producers follow intuitive musical groupings, such as putting the rhythm section on the bottom, voices in the center, additional or obligato instruments on top. These tracks can scroll indefinitely, left to right. And at a bird's eye view, they provide a textural or almost architectural view of musical construction. Patterns emerge visually, and many producers clarify structures with formal labels, as we saw in Ethan Hines' video, especially when describing their own working methods. Zooming in on these tracks, however, would reveal a dichotomy. Some tracks use MIDI data, which is often represented as a piano roll, so named after the rolls that would feed performance information into a player piano. But other tracks, such as live instruments or sounds, exist only as waveforms. That is all the tracks you see here, I believe. These convey information about volume. They can be used to watch for articulation, phrasing, and the saturation of sonic space. But they notably omit pitch information. And they filter other data through their rather abstract visualization of volume. In these aspects of digital audio production, our visual metaphors fail. DAW producers must rely on their ears rather than their eyes, an intriguing counterweight to the ocular centrism of Western music theory. I'll show just a moment from the Collier clip here where you'll see the difference uh, visually and, uh, and orally between his layered vocal sounds and he's about to add some piano through the software. So, so you know what I can do here um, is something pretty, pretty cool. And keyboards over this and we'll see what we got. Hey, gee. Don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it bad. So you can see a bit of difference there in the piano roll notation on the red line for the keyboard compared to the waveforms of the rest. So the emerging genre of DAW project file breakdowns also sits on a straight line between two otherwise disparate genres of media. On one side, the behind the scenes podcast devoted to pop music, such as Song Exploder and Switched On Pop, which interviews artists and often plays excerpts of their prominent recordings and sometimes even studio masters or reduced alternate versions. On the other side of the spectrum, we might position technical tutorials from programs like Ableton. There are many videos designed to actually teach users how to use the software from the ground up. A straight line via session breakdowns connects these two genres, which have both now been accepted to exist within music theory. There is composition pedagogy and publicly accessible analysis and exposition, what we call public music theory, about which more later. Now, the audience for this kind of content is surprisingly large. John Moore has described this audience as a music digital subculture, a community of interest that watches music theory or other educational videos on YouTube, participates in discussion about music on various social media platforms, and shares and debates the concepts and examples being discussed. Even beyond this subculture is the larger sphere of interested enthusiasts who might read or share articles on websites like Slate or Vox, and who listen to podcasts like Song Explorer which even became its own Netflix TV show recently. This broad audience and a multimedia consideration of these videos raises the question of just how far we might usefully push the definition of a contemporary music theoretical instrument. Is YouTube itself an instrument of music theory? Is screen capture software, a podcast aggregator, a Facebook post or a share button? Perhaps not strictly in the sense of creating musical knowledge, but certainly it is in the sense argued for by Paula Harper in her 2019 dissertation, that listening and sharing are vital extensions that constitute a meaningful form of communal musical consumption. Let's go to our final case study in which we'll shift gears a little bit. On March 21st, 2019, Google commemorated Johann Sebastian Bach's 334th birthday by releasing what they call a doodle, one in a very long series of alternate headers for their homepage, which are often animated or interactive, and usually posted in observance of a holiday or an anniversary. Google has a long history of musical doodles, and when a new one comes out, it's always circulated quickly among musicians and music lovers alike. In many ways, these doodles are like little musical toys. 
They're designed to be accessible and to provide space for a little bit of experimentation, all while generally having enough guides in place that whatever you produce can still sound good. Now, this particular doodle operates by giving the user two measures of blank sheet music, as you see here. By clicking on this staff, one can enter a brief melody, and pressing a button will submit that melody for harmonization. Here, a machine learning model that's been trained on a corpus of Bach chorales will parse the user's entry. It makes a guess at a key, and sometimes, based on the input, decides whether modulation is appropriate and it adds alto, tenor, and bass voices in chorale style. The user can then see the notation, hear the track played back, and they can even save a MIDI file of the output. They can also press a refresh button that will harmonize the same melody again in a different way. Now, this Bach doodle is one small part of a much larger initiative at Google. It was a collaboration between two research teams within the company, the People and AI research team and Magenta, a team concerned specifically with music and machine learning. Magenta's website is full of demos, more than 20 of them. A quick survey of these tools indicates that the Magenta research team has a great interest in translating music between different formats, various kinds of human input, streams of MIDI or other music encoding formats, and through signal processing, actual audio recordings. Tonight, I'll focus mostly on the Bach Google Doodle. Google provides an admirable amount of documentation for its research projects and the tools that emerge from them, and the Bach Doodle is no exception. Here I should note as well that while this is an endeavor mostly carried out by a machine learning team at Google, there are many academics who are engaged in similar research projects, machine learning driven composition, data driven ways of looking at music, analyzing music, composing music. The Doodle itself in its public facing version comes with a simple explanation of functions. Those who wish to know more can follow links to a series of increasingly complex technical summaries. At the sort of intermediate level is a blog post on the machine learning model that drives the doodle. This model is nicknamed CocoNet. It's been trained on a corpus of Bach chorales, not simply through exposure, but through targeted tasks of completion and recomposition. In the words of the team, quote, CocoNet is trained to restore Bach's music from fragments. We take a piece of Bach, we randomly erase some notes, and we ask the model to guess the missing notes from context. The result is a versatile model of counterpoint that accepts arbitrarily incomplete scores as input and works out complete scores. This setup covers a wide range of musical tasks, such as harmonizing melodies, creating smooth transitions, rewriting and elaborating existing music, and composing from scratch. Now in this paragraph and elsewhere in the documentation, CocoNet is pretty explicitly aimed at solving a classic musicological problem, completing an incomplete score. Say you've got a set of part books with one voice missing, or that you'd like to perform Bach's Art of Fugue or Mozart's Requiem, two famously incomplete works whose speculative completions have been undertaken by numerous composers and scholars over the centuries. The model works through music in multiple passes rather than as a linear beginning to end motion. And its designers argue that this makes it a more versatile model suited to a variety of compositional tasks. The public facing one of the doodle is only one of these tasks. And while the public face of the doodle is conventional music notation, the technical documents point us to an alternate interface that gives a closer visualization of how CocoNet actually sees musical space. It sees a Cartesian grid with MIDI note numbers, low to high across the left-hand side and semi-quaver sized slices of time, 16th note sized. Since this doodle only came out two years ago, you may remember hearing about it. Perhaps you even played with it yourself at the time. You may also remember the general assessment within the music theory, music theory community that the doodles imitations of Bach left much to be desired. Bachlash goes the headline of a general interest piece published by music theorist Alyssa Barna. Music theorists are furious about the Google Doodle. Barna tried the Google Doodle itself and she documented its errors. These included a strange key signature attribution and several basic voice leading errors like parallel fifths. Those she interviewed went even farther. Chris Brody, a Bach scholar, said, quote, 
it would be hard to think of a single generally true fact about Bach's idiom that the AI seems to have accurately observed and manages not to break almost constantly. To give one example of the mistakes the model can sometimes make, I'll play an excerpt that ends with an especially dissonant leap in the tenor, compounded by a dissonant succession known as a cross relation from the G sharp in the tenor to the G in the bass. You can see both of these in the lower staff near the end of the excerpt. And I'll play the doodles MIDI output. So right at the end, a couple of sour notes. Given these shortcomings then, what can we make of this piece of software as an instrument for thinking about music theory? I decided to conduct a few experiments of my own, feeding the doodle an actual Bach excerpt to see what it would do. This is one of those outputs. I entered the first two measures from a Bach chorale, making sure to select one, a simple one that began on the downbeat since the doodle can't really handle upbeats and changing the metrical structure of a, mel of a melody will change the interpretation. And I chose one that was usefully sparse as well. Bach wrote this chorale in E minor, as you see here, but out of context, I feel that the opening measures could be interpreted in a few different keys. Now the Bach doodle agreed with me. I ran the melody through 12 times and I saved the output each time. The doodle harmonized the, the excerpt in E minor six out of these 12 times, and it chose either C major or A minor three times each. And I'll note once this A minor was even A major. Bach's original harmonization modulates from E minor to G major, which for the record is the most likely harmonic path for an excerpt like this to take. Two of the C major harmonizations modulate to G, the most likely secondary key, while one features an unusual modulation to E minor, the minor three chord. Among the harmonizations in A, one of them remains in A while the other two modulate down a step to G major, another unusual choice. These surprising modulations might indicate that after making its initial decision about a key, the model can change its mind midstream, attempting to steer into more secure harmonic territory but having no externally imposed guidelines against changing to unusual keys. Now, one way that we might interpret this model is just like the examples from YouTube or as viral artifacts from other social media platforms. We can interpret them through that central aesthetic identified by Carol Vernalis, repetition. Yes, like Barna notes, a single harmonization might choose the wrong key or might turn in some bad voice leading but the next harmonization could get it right, or the one after that. A single trial or 12 trials isn't where a machine learning model will shine. 1,200 trials or 12,000 would be the order of magnitude needed to really learn what CocoNet knows of Bach. Just as viral performances take some of their meaning from their participation in larger currents on social media, so too do Google's musical toys. Each click of the play button gives only one example that needs to be contextualized among many. As music theorist and AI researcher Daniel Tompkins pointed out shortly after the release of the doodle, CocoNet's approach to composition and harmonization differs from another possible computational uh, approach, that of a purely rules-driven algorithm for counterpoint. As Tompkins writes, it would be very possible to create a model that could produce two or three or four voice counterpoint without breaking any rules. But because that model would tread so lightly and deliberately, it would tend not to produce very interesting output as it would tend to do a lot of the same things each time. CocoNet, however, relies on weighted possibilities honed through numerous trials so that it has no firm prohibition on the kinds of voice leading errors that would be marked incorrect on an undergraduate harmony assignment. Only presumably a statistical understanding that Bach does certain things more often than others. As I've shown above, it has no set template for standard formal gestures, such as the idea of modulating to certain keys. In effect, the model is willing to try things out based on the possibilities it's been exposed to. These are issues that computational musicologists are well aware of and they've studied intensely. So I don't mean to be glib in focusing on a single simple example. But if we think about coconut, coconut 
in comparison to the rule-driven module that Tompkins mentions, we might find that it's actually a bit more authentic a simulation, if in spirit at least, if not in the details, of the fact that the canonical composers on which music theory pedagogy tends to be based would follow the rules only until they didn't. This is a distinction that's sometimes difficult to convey to a frustrated undergraduate. And in fact, it's no coincidence that this distinction between two styles of computer-aided counterpoint, one that anxiously follows the rules, one that stumbles about in search of something nice, these are many of the same anxieties and debates that surround the gulf between didactic composition in the classroom and the music proposed, produced by practicing composers even within the relatively narrow band of the Baroque or classical styles. That is to say, to say nothing about the efficacy or appropriateness of training 21st musicians to work in those 18th century styles. This is a debate that has raged for decades within the pages of music theory pedagogy journals, which has taken on a new urgency as music departments around the world take steps to diversify their curricula. The disjunction between the two varieties of computer-aided composition also usefully recapitulates the two kinds of music theoretical instruments modeled by Redding in dialogue with the history of science. A computerized species counterpoint program that works purely from a rule set might be a materialized theory, for example, in Bachelard's terms. It concretizes or perhaps externalizes the set of counterpoint rules, applying them in order to generate a corpus of objectively correct exercises. Viewed from another perspective, a rules-driven program sees counterpoint as some kind of game or formal system which might eventually be solved by generating all legal harmonizations of a given cantus firmus. In quite a different way though, Google's Bach Doodle isn't interested in solving counterpoint, but rather simulating, augmenting, perhaps eventually improving the way that people write in four voices. Ironically, by letting their model grow through training, and by attempting solutions on its own, the Magenta team have created Rheinberger's epistemic thing. They've created a site where musical knowledge or meaning can emerge serendipitously from a combination of human input and interpretation, the neural network's distinctly non-human model of musical style, and the element of randomness and iteration. This network more accurately mirrors real conditions of composition than a purely rules-driven model would. Its occasional absolute howlers are just part of an iterative process meant to understand and extend human creativity rather than supersede it. Now, as we conclude, I wanna spend a moment thinking about the role of public music theory in all of this. Music theory, like many disciplines in the arts and humanities, has taken a strong interest in public engagement recently. Public music theory has become a thriving field, one that both encourages scholars to reach beyond the boundaries of the academy and one that is home to studies like this one, which takes seriously the impact and importance of vernacular music theories as they are practiced in public spaces for general audiences. As I've written elsewhere in that paper on music theory and the epistemology of the internet, general interest expressions of music theory should be of great interest to scholars because they tend to reflect musical academia's successes and failures back in our own faces. In a very real sense, academic ideas do trickle outwards into the general consciousness. As the students we teach go on to, for instance, make YouTube videos about the songs they love, or they grow up to get jobs working on machine learning at Google. And we should not underestimate the impact that we can make when enthusiasts stumble across our open access publications and apply our ideas beyond institutional structures. There is great interest in music theory out there, both among what Moore has called the music digital subculture that forms the core audience for instruments of music theory as I've demonstrated tonight, but also among the general public. We should embrace this, learn from it, contribute to it. So where does this leave us? What are some of the threads that we ought to take away from this analysis of 21st century music theoretical instruments? What can artists and academics learn from this tour of digital musicking and theorizing? First of all, the tools and the genres of videos, the artifacts I've described today, bring music theory and analysis into close contact with performance. As numerous scholars have shown, all musical instruments embed some theoretical outlook towards sound production within their very designs. But in the case studies I've shown here, I think, 
performance and theory are entwined especially closely. Each one doesn't just support the other, rather it makes the other possible, whether we're speaking of cover performances or DAW breakdowns. Second, along with bridging the gap between analysis and performance, these digital artifacts draw theory and analysis closer together as well. Now, I'm aware that this distinction functions differently on either side of the Atlantic, but if we broadly define analysis as being concerned with individual works and theory as being concerned with the nature of musical things writ large, I think we can see how these videos and tools bring the two poles together. Solo cover videos and tutorial videos are deeply speculative in that they propose ways that music could go. In the case of Luca Stricagnoli, they show how instruments could be built or could be modified. They extend our capabilities in performance. Recall Redding's dictum about music theoretical instruments popping up around the limits of human performance. And they propose new formal organizations and new modes of musical storytelling. In the case of Google's machine learning experiments, materialized theories even produce toys that we can play with, machines for producing artifacts of latent musical virality. Third, contemporary instruments of music theory are often visual in nature or they have a visual aspect that is closely tied with what they do. It's difficult to imagine a cover like the ones created by Luca Stricagnoli or Kavehi having the same impact if we were not able to watch them assemble their ambidextrous arrangements. Dawes, as I noted, mix established visual metaphors for musical space with numerous other parameters that are not so easily visualized. And while the Bach Doodle's aesthetics aren't directly contributing to the music it makes, its design playfully imagines an archaic mechanical metaphor for its solid state processor driven musicking, perhaps referring to the long tradition of inquiry into mechanized musical creativity from which it draws. Fourth, these examples here are not just defined by the materials, popular music by and large, or by their treatments of those materials in creative arrangements, in banks of effects or virtual instruments, or in the black box of a recurrent neural network. The tools I've shown are also defined by their participation in a sharing-based ecosystem of social media and the drive towards repetition and iteration that comes with it. Designed to be eminently shareable, they offer novelty within the framework of recognizable microgenres. As scholars like Paula Harper and Carol Vernalis have shown, one of the chief logics of social media is variation on a theme. This is the essence of the meme as a recognizable comedic structure or context-driven statement. All of the examples I've shared today gain what currency they have by participating in addictively iterative loops. One more harmonization, one more interesting cover, one more Ableton production trick. Google's doodles and their reset button or the ability to submit one's score to the training corpus encourage users to try CocoNet's harmonizations over and over, making the most of successful examples by sharing them, perhaps even making the most of comically unsuccessful examples. And song analyses from podcasts to DAW tutorials and in between function most effectively as a kind of archive, gaining significance as util and utility as they draw more and more and more examples together to make them easily browsable. Finally, the theoretical instruments I've described offer new perspectives on musical structure. In covers, for example, we see essential features of songs exchanged, rearranged, and emphasized with other identifying details left behind. In the case of DAW tutorials, musicians and producers pull back the curtain on a conception of music that places timbre, arrangement, processing effects, and groove just as central, just as centrally as harmony, melody, or rhythm. And I don't think it would be going too far to say that these digital artifacts show us that one of the most vital areas of inquiry for music theory going forward will be how we negotiate musical data in all of its forms. In the viral artifacts we've seen tonight, we've seen Western staff notation foregrounded. We've also seen digital audio stations that serve as a meeting place for MIDI streams and for the waveforms of recorded performances and sound effects. And finally, we've seen musicians juggling loops and fragmented sounds, using them as the metaphorical building blocks of music, loops as notation in a certain way. 
Given the present anxieties and debates in both the US and the UK about how to balance the teaching of music notation versus the skills and tools in demand for sound production, it seems that the artifacts we've seen today show us that what will really be needed in the coming years will be the ability to work with both notation and sound waves as computationally legible data and to contribute to the hard problems of helping computers to mediate between them. It should be apparent by now that the above three of these categories, above these three categories, lies the ultimate music theoretical tool of the 21st century, the internet itself. The connections forged between artist and audience, the ability of an otherwise disparate audience to crystallize into an enthusiastic subculture, the share button and the promise of viral success. All of these are essential contexts for what I've discussed today. And as many of us, depending on our schedules, wind down our third semesters characterized by online teaching and virtual research symposia, it seems increasingly clear that the communications technologies of the social internet are not only the media through which music theoretical ideas are transmitted today, but that these digital communications technologies and those who use them both inside and outside of the, of the academy are also essential in shaping music theoretical knowledge for the new millennium, helping to set the agenda and to push the field forwards in new directions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so interesting and thought provoking. And I'm sure lots of people have questions, but um, I'm going to start this Q&A by asking my old question, mm -hmm. um, which is, do you think, obviously, music theory and theoretical instruments all have their um, strengths and their weaknesses? And you've spoken about um, quite a wide variety of digital music theoretical instruments. But do you feel they have less weaknesses or different weaknesses to traditional music theoretical instruments? That's a very good question. Um, I think that I would have to say, you know, I mean, that's a that's a, a really big question for all of this. I would have to say that you you sort of think about the the task at hand or the repertoire at hand. Um, you know, one of the things that I sort of like doing that I find productive in music theory is to kind of have a, a, a mismatch between the repertoire and the theoretical tool. I think that tells you a lot um, in terms of what, what is successful in analysis and what sort of falls short in analysis. Um, you know, I, I often find that you can learn something by taking, you know, neo-Romanian theory and looking at, at uh, chromatic Renaissance music with it and see where it matches up and where it doesn't match up. Um, you know, that's, that's just one tool among many. But I would say that you, you get something a little bit different when you start to think as broadly about music theory as I've been trying to do with, with this talk. Um, when you start to think about how does a digital audio workstation express a theory of music, um, I think that it sort of lets you find new ways of thinking about sound, new ways of thinking about, uh, you know, familiar music. For example, you know, those, uh, those sound waves that I was talking about mean that you can't so easily see pitch content. You sort of have to mouse over things. You have to listen to them. You have to move them around and know exactly where you are in a way that you don't know if you're working with a paper score or with Sibelius, for example. Um, so I would say that they yield new insight um, and that it's really useful to look at things in that different way, but also that there are, there are going to be shortcomings, you know, in the sense that once you've committed to maybe working with something in one format, you can't control or tweak um, parameters that, that fit into the other format. And I suppose that what I would say in the conclusion of my talk is that ideally we would embrace both sides, for example, of looking at a musical problem and sort of learn to bring them together. And I think that's one of the major challenges that faces the discipline of music theory is not only as, is as we diversify our repertoire, as we look at new styles of music that haven't traditionally been theorized, um, we, we sort of need to learn to bring our theoretical tools to speak together and to help each other out in that way. Um, in ways that are sometimes experimental or anachronistic. And that's, uh, you know, sort of exciting, but also sort of, sort of challenging to think about. 
Yeah, you know, I'm always really surprised by how similar the interfaces of digital audio workstations mm -hmm. look. And I kind of worried that if we all look, like literally look at music in the same way, we are all going to make the same type of music, or mm -hmm. at least that perhaps we now have um, an added responsibility as theorists to um, call to attention the kind of particularities of each instrument in a way that perhaps we, because these instruments weren't so widely used before, we didn't used to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of a trade-off in, in that you want your software to be accessible. You know, you want your someone new to be able to switch maybe from one platform to the other and, and be able to use it usefully. But yeah, that has the effect of kind of reproducing different structures, but again, reproducing conceptual structures in the same way that, that constrains your thinking, just maybe in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? I can't see if people have um, raised hands. Um, okay, sorry. So there's actually three people with their hands raised. Um, so maybe, I think I have asked the Maybe we'll take it on. Um, so I have asked David to unmute, and then we have Dan, and then we also have Christopher. So thank you, um, Bill. Thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to actually build off of Lucia's last, just that last comment, because the the subject of this whole conversation is the instrument. It's the design of the instrument. But the interface design of a DAW or a VST or the logic of a chord naming algorithm or the format of musical data, uh, those are conceived and programmed initially by people. And I'm wondering, I mean, are those people theorists? Are the people who designed the loop, like the clip within a timeline structure of Ableton Live, are they doing theory or do musicians and theorists sort of react analytically to the whims and intuitions of this hidden magical group of people? In other words, like what's the line between music theory and technology design? Should music theory programs be teaching people how to program computers? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, thanks for, uh, for coming to the talk and for uh, a great question. Yeah, I mean, my, I guess I have a couple of reactions to that. I mean, number one, my first intuition is to say that yes, they are doing music theory. Um, in a very real way and that they they have to apply musical knowledge and that musical knowledge then trickles out and is used by other people in the same way that Shankarian analysis gets used by people or Neo-Ramanian theory gets used um, to, uh, to do theoretical work. Um, at the same time, I, th I think that ideally we would say that these people are musicians. I mean, many of the programmers who make Sibelius and, and Ableton are, you know, highly trained musicians, whether that's through, you know, pop music experience, music school, you know, computer science degrees, um, they definitely are bringing musical experience to bear on these problems. Uh, several of the Google team, for example, are composers and artists alongside being engineers. And they talk about, you know, in, the, in those blog posts about the Google Doodle, they talk about, you know, in my own compositional practice, this was something that I was interested in. You know, one of the lead designers talks about how she, is interested in sort of being able to try out ideas over and over again. Here's an idea, keep what I like, wipe some things away, run the thing again, keep what I like, wipe some things away. Um, so I guess, I, I don't know, this, this feels to me like it's dodging the question, but I would say that in many cases, they are musicians and music theorists and that we shouldn't, you know, maybe shouldn't be so quick to say that they aren't doing music theory in the same way that, you know, people in academia are doing. Um, they really are. It just comes out through software platforms uh, rather than maybe written articles or something like that. But that, to answer the last part, I, I do think um, one of the challenges, I spoke of challenges to undergraduate education, but one of the challenges to graduate education is how to prepare people for a field that is going in all these different directions and how to prepare them to speak, you know, most of the things that I've learned about this so far have been self-taught or have been through watching the very same tutorials as, uh, you know, as I'm eventually trying to write about. You know, it would be very nice in a lot of graduate programs to think computationally more often about music theory. Um, but that's a, a big problem.
problem in both in, in squeezing it into our curricula and in finding faculty to teach those courses or, or building collaborations with our schools of engineering and things like that. Uh, yeah, ideally in a perfect world, absolutely to everything you said. <laughs> uh, I've just been asked to unmute, so I suppose it's on to me. Uh, thanks for a great talk. That was gr that was brilliant. Very, very interesting as well with the, the case studies that you present as well and things like that. So thank you. Um, thank you it's really interesting to see, obviously, understanding these things as instruments when they're sort of modes for creation and things like that. I think mm -hmm. you're I think it was your first case study with Ethan Hine showing the door mm. and that sort of analysis that really got me thinking about challenges with undergraduate or postgraduate and that mm -hmm. alternative assignments has been a massive thing about the pandemic mm -hmm. and things like um, assigning my students to come up with a kind of scripted YouTube video which is a taught through analysis mm -hmm. and some students um, I've been involved with courses I've reviewed courses up at Liverpool where you don't use notation when teaching analysis. Mm -hmm. So this kind of door input is really, really useful. Yeah. What other avenues do you think, or, or could you predict or something like that about alternative assessments for these things? Because I'm really interested in this, in seeing these kind of applications. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really excellent. Um, a really excellent question. One of the things that I do with my own students is I make them do podcasts, you know, like I mentioned Song Exploder and things like that. And that's, that's you know, I actually would be interested to run this survey again. I wrote a bit for a pedagogy uh, collection about doing the podcast. And one of the things that I found from polling my students who did that, you know, they had to do maybe a 10 minute podcast. I showed them how to do some basic editing so that they could drop in a sample of their song and they could then talk about it and things like that. And one of the things that I found is that they felt that that was sort of the right, the right amount of challenge for them. Um, you know, in terms of do a little bit of audio editing, write a script, convey some ideas, and that they preferred that both to, um, you know, live presentation in class, which isn't always practical if there's 30 of them. Um, and they prefer that also to being made to make a video. Um, now this was in 2019 that I did this. So I wonder post pandemic, if students are now ready for more, ready to have more kind of thrown at them. And I'm sure that, you know, people creating alternative assessments, um, they've really, you know, I'm sure that people have explored this and have pushed the boundaries even far beyond that. Um, but really, what I would say I'd like to see and that I have, I have not yet really explored, um, but would be collaborative um, endeavors in these directions. I think that one really uh, interesting potential thing to do with undergraduate students would be to get you know, interdisciplinary groups together, whether to find those in little pods within your, uh, within your classes so that a student who has some video experience, a student that has some audio experience, a student that, you know, is, uh, brings different levels of expertise in the table because all of our schools are full of these people with different interests. We, we don't always engage them in a music theory class. Um, that's my own sort of long-term, you know, I'd really like to do this, but I have to figure out the ways, the institutional and physical, you know, uh, ways of making that happen. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Dan. That was great. Hi, um, William. Thank you so much for your presentation, which I've really enjoyed. And like um, Dan, was kind of blown away by some of the examples <laughs> in it. Um, thank you. My um, question might be a little bit nerdy. Um, but, um, and so apologies in advance, but, uh -huh. um, you know, um, it, from what I understand it, um, I, I mean, what maybe a way into it is like this, like from a certain perspective, the examples you've shown are extremely niche and, um, uh, it's a kind of internet genre. Um, you know, it's a deep dive into a world that, um, uh, yeah, it is avidly followed by a certain um, kind of subculture, use that word somewhere in there, um, and then might not be known out, outside of it. Um, but then from another perspective, um, the, a more kind of material perspective, um, they're all quite contrasting examples. So, um, you know, the first one is um, a kind of video example and um, the second one is a door example and the third one is a kind of machine learning AI, AI example um, and you know going back to how you set up the paper at the start with the references to the kind of um, Reading paper um, 
what I kind of understand from that is this attempt to um, kind of bring German me media theory to music um, analysis um, and music theory. Um, and I'm, I suppose what I'm wondering is whether um, the digital, the internet, um, in your view, um, poses problems to that, um, that, that sort of episteme, um, you know, um, in that Reading paper that you talked about, there's a, a very heavy focus on um, materiality um, and the sort of um, material constraints of instruments and systems of writing and, and so on. Um, and then, um, you know, when we start to think about the internet and digital systems in that way, it gets extremely complex quickly. And as you said in your talk, you know, um, rightly, yeah, these are um, not musical instruments, not music theory sort of um, tools there. Um, uh, you know, yeah, they're, be, they're being used for this purpose. Um, so I suppose what I'd be interested in hearing you talk to a little bit is just um, how you situate this in relation to that body of uh, thought, the kind of very materially focused kind of um, uh, German media theory that, you know, was was set up at the front a little bit, but you you sort of moved away from slightly, probably for good reason. Um, so yeah, can you can you talk to that? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Christopher. That's that's an excellent question, um, and it is a it is a big issue. You've you've sort of uh, whether intentionally or not, you've cut to one of the the core issues. So what he's mentioning when he when he talks of uh, German media theory is that Alex. Who, unfortunately had to go already, uses a lot of Kittler in uh, these, these 2016 explorations. Um, and he talks about various configurations as discourse networks. And sort of uh, one of the examples that he begins one of the papers with is sort of, you have a theory classroom with a piano in the corner with you know a written musical score uh, with sort of these different ways of getting at the same uh, information. And I, you know, I have considered a little bit of that in this in uh, applying to these, and I have found myself moving away from it because I I don't find, as you suggest, I don't find that it's quite so perfect a mapping. I mean, I think that the this German media theory is very interesting in terms of thinking about how something you know conveys information, how it writes it down, how it can be sort of circulated from person to person. Um, but I think that that is if I were to distill the problem that I think I might be having in doing it, I think it's sort of fundamentally opposed to the same idea of the subculture that you um, talked about. There's a, there's a problem for internet-based theorizing writ large, not just about music. Um, there's a problem when you try to have a model of, I have information X and I do something to it and I send it over to site Y. There's a problem with a, with a model that is sort of interested in, you know, transmitting singular messages. I think that it sort of needs to be transmitting in all different directions. It needs to be going back and forth. Um, and it needs to be thinking about how these things kind of interact in very different ways. Um, I think one of the things that I have not yet begun to get my head around is um, how you would define this I don't know, this, these sort of ideas that I'm trying to hone in on. Um, you know, John Moore is here who coined the phrase um, music digital subculture that I used. And when I read his thesis a couple of weeks ago uh, where he talks about this and he talks about Jacob Collier and sort of the circulation of music theory concepts, um, that was a, a revelation for me actually that it's one of the things that I'm trying to articulate. But it's a subculture that exists on so many different platforms. You can't as much as the talk to me sometimes feels like, oh, I have these three really different things that I'm trying to bring together. Um, I don't think that these ideas can be reduced to, I'm doing something with YouTube, um, you know, because I think that it's these, the circulation of these um, kind of para-academic ideas of music theory are happening on so many different platforms simultaneously. All of these platforms cross-pollinate with each other in various ways. Um, and I find it a really, it's a, it is a really challenging thing to kind of get my head around establishing the boundaries of what I mean, because 
you talk about it being very niche and being very subcultural, there are aspects that are completely, you know, hidden from a lot of public view. And then there are aspects like the Google thing that kind of poke their heads out for a couple of days and get a lot of attention and, you know, some mainstream attention or something really, something creative on YouTube really goes viral and you see a musical performance and, you know, pop up on a, a morning talk show or something like that. There's this weird effect where everything kind of bubbles below the surface until it pops up. And it's, it's tough to get, uh, my head around what is really the boundary of that medium or how to define, uh, you know, that to discourse network to use the, to use the, the term that it's actually going off in so many more directions. Thank you though. So that's an excellent question and lots, lots for me to think about uh, in terms of how I deal with that. <laughs> I mean, just as a thought, it strikes me having listened to your answer and thinking about it that, um, you know, uh, there's such an emphasis on um, storage media, isn't there, I guess, mm -hmm. um, during media theory and, yeah. you know, the importance of writing um, mm -hmm. and storage and really um, it's not adequate talking about something like the internet mm -hmm. for the simple fact that it's you know we're talking about really broadcasting um so yeah i mm -hmm. it's just a, a thought but you you know maybe a question is whether that whether a kind of killarian approach um has the sort of um resources to deal with broadcasting actually mm -hmm. um, the question uh, yeah. yeah and the difficulty of dealing with interfaces too i mean there's there's storage and writing as a medium on on the one hand and then there's kind of this idea of you filter the things that you do you filter your you know musical ideas or you filter your creativity through what the thing in front of you makes possible the piano is one medium the daw is a very very different medium um, and it's, it's almost, I wonder if almost theorizing them as, as active dynamic things is what's the obstacle. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I have a question again mm -hmm. um, about this course. Um, I feel like the, uh, or at least I think through your talk, I've come to realize that the online popular music theory discourse and mm -hmm. the academic discourse are becoming perhaps closer and closer to mm -hmm. one another, um, particularly with now um, all the theorists uploading you know, their conferences to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if in terms of uh, music theoretical instruments, if those are also, from a historical point of view, becoming closer and closer to um, traditional Hmm. music theoretical instruments and is um, history and like the intellectual history of these things a concern for you or are you looking at it from um, just the point of view of now? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that the, inst that the intellectual history is important for it, that there is much more to be said there. Um, you know, Alex's work on this, on the, instruments of music theory, I think, leaves a lot of space. I mean, he's, it's, it's very, very thought provoking, but it also is his articles on this topic are set up in such a way that they essentially skip from, you know, 1550 to 1920 or so, um, that there's lots of space in between to fill in. There's lots more intellectual history to be done. But I, I mean, I think that it's that everything we do has these histories baked into them, as I think it was David sort of talking about um, Dawes or um, the way that these things constrain what we do. This is, you know, something I've admittedly not looked into quite enough, but there's a lot of analysis to be done to say how did music production programs get to be the way that they are and sort of doing this semi recent intellectual history that I think needs to be tied into much longer histories of music theory and histories of writing. Um, I mean, as, as you sort of speak to academic and, and non-academic spaces coming closer together, when I'm talking about this, I actually frequently another sort of Kitlerian idea comes to mind, which is Kitler has this 
you know, often, often repeated idea that entertainment technologies uh, or communicative technologies sort of start out with the military and they filter out into entertainment. You know, these things that are weapons of war, or radio, um, that are then repurposed in the service of, you know, other purposes. And I, I sometimes think that about music theory in certain ways as well. Um, you know, that, that ideas that are, are formed somehow academically end up filtering out somehow, not directly. I'm not saying that, that music theorists have this, you know, huge impact on the world or that there are lots of people out there reading our scholarly articles. But as I sort of talk about in that uh, music theory in the internet uh, essay from a couple of years ago, these, these ideas that musical academia tries to work through have a tendency to pop up in popular discourse, you know, our uh, sort of reductive ideas about sort of music being of the mind and, you know, the body being separated from it is a big, you know, philosophical idea throughout Western thought. And it's something that has circled around music theory in various ways. And lo and behold, you see it popping up um, in sort of general interest music analyses. You see people relying on these dichotomies that we like to think we have deconstructed in our current work, but, you know, that also in, in other guises, our field has been sort of guilty of creating or of perpetuating. Um, so I think that there's this interesting idea where our ideas filter out, but you're absolutely onto something that those lines are becoming a lot fuzzier and many scholars, you know, are putting their work online. Many of us, you know, many people are, are uh, you know, have, have YouTube channels or have, uh, you know, alter, sort of alter egos. I'm looking at Dan here, who's, I know he's, uh, is a YouTube producer as well as being an academic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, thanks for a really fascinating presentation. I'm Thank you. speaking from the media arts department mm -hmm. where kind of, I guess we're thinking about some of similar things like how, what our timeline looks like, obviously how we handle sound too. But I was wondering about what the focus just on this part of the mm -hmm. um, I've actually put um, of, of the kind of production process or the ways in which things are made. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually working on um, some kind of binaural sound pieces for mm -hmm. um, uh, the Imperial War Museum and different people like representations of um, mm -hmm. Uh, the Second World War and the Holocaust in binaural sound, both using kind of sound composition and at some points music and text and whatever. But I was really struck by what one of the contributors posted um, on on Twitter, and I know that he's talking about our project. And he says, mm -hmm. as someone who recorded sound onto tape, which we then cut with a razor, it amazes me that tonight I recorded something on a phone in our living room, pressed a button, it went to a sound editor living miles away sound quotes traveled without it being quote sound mm -hmm. what really and it seems to me that actually the ways you know it's not just mm -hmm. in the production and the reception but also in you know the fact that it's kind of it's kind of fungible in some or do you mm -hmm. know what i mean there's something about the the being able to manipulate you mm -hmm. know as music or as image zeros and ones and be able to transfer them instantly, which seems mm -hmm. to be also like a really important part of the ways in which we're maybe theorizing music uh, music or theorizing cultural production. Mm -hmm. And maybe it'd be interesting to see how both you might include or think about that, but maybe mm -hmm. also thinking about that going backwards in terms mm. of what it meant in terms of kind of how people listened or how people exchanged what it was that they were mm -hmm. ever it was that they were exchanging when they kind of passed music on in that way yeah i wondered if you've got any thoughts about that yeah thank you so much adam that's that's uh, a wonderful quote i mean i i think that it's sort of it's interesting because almost, you know, working with sound in this almost handicraft kind of way, like this idea of touching sound, of holding it, of doing things with it is, um, I think in many ways, a, a really sort of essential fantasy of music theory. You know, it's this really strong desire that we have, I think, to, to work with sound in, 
in uh, certain ways. And I think that's probably true of, of composers as filtered through various different aesthetics. You know, one of the things that I personally find find appealing about, for example, uh, what, what kicked off this whole project and this whole string of interest was the Kavehi video, um, you know, recording the loops of the Nirvana song beforehand and sort of doing it. And I think one of the things that really appeals to me about that video is, is this sense that I have that she's creating little parts and kind of setting them aside, that she's kind of, you know, recording a bit and I'll put it here and come back to it. I'm gonna put this here, I'm gonna put this here and then kind of, you know, metaphorically picking them back up as she, you know, and, and recombining them. And yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a really, a really powerful way of thinking about sound. And in the the aspects of this that I find the most compelling, I sort of see little traces of that metaphor of touching and shaping, or of uh, you know of the the tactility that sort of comes in with this. One of the things that I didn't have a chance to talk about is that one of those DAW tutorials is all about all the non musical things that the guy puts into the track, you know, he's got, um, you know, jet engines along with the sort of build up and the bass, you know, he uses jet engine noises. He shows how he found, you know, he's walking around his house during lockdown and he found a cigarette lighter and he uses it to create sort of high end, you know, hi hat sounds to give his drums more space and things like that. And, uh, and I find that a really compelling aspect of, of all of this, that as a music theorist, I don't entirely, know how to deal with, I guess, is, is how I would wrap this, this answer up, is that these things are really fascinating, this sort of fantasy of working directly with sound, whereas so much of music theory is working in notation. You know, I find myself going to the piano so that I can sort of touch notation metaphorically. Um, and, you know, working in notation has its own pleasure, working without the sound. But uh, I think that, for me at least, what, what makes music theory often so satisfying is, is to kind of work in tangible uh, ways with sounds. Thanks so much, Adam. That was a great prompt. Yeah, I suppose the one thing I would say is also the relation between um, sound is, and materiality, but also time. Mm -hmm. And there's that wonderful, what's her name, Grace, I can't remember, the woman who, who uh, kind of was responsible for the word bug being used because they really were bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she was kind of someone in the Navy or something, but mm -hmm. a computing pioneer. Um, but she used to hold up a piece of wire and say, this is a nanosecond, which was the amount, you know, mm -hmm. the distance traveled by, you know, an electrical charge at the speed mm -hmm. of light, or a nanosecond or whatever, but actually, thinking about where that materiality does still exist mm -hmm. is actually a really interesting thing also to do. Yeah, and the But wires. thank you, it's really uh, yeah, a great deal to think about. It's mm -hmm. been really uh, inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we're going to have to end the session with that. But before we leave, because um, we've mentioned Google a couple of times and also the divide mm -hmm. between creative practitioners and designers, um, so just to mention that on June the 3rd, we're going to be hosting Maya Mann, who is a dancer and a choreographer, but also a creative technologist at Google. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can, you can um, tell Lily and register for mm -hmm. that. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I was just going to say that we have uh, one more comment or perhaps question by John Moore, and I'm not sure whether you would want to yeah. on that or not. But. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> hang on, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um. There probably. Uh, hi again. Uh, there probably won't um be time because um, like I could talk about this forever as the <laughs> already knows. So um, I think we, we'll we'll catch up privately very soon. But thank you so much and thanks for the name drop. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, thanks for your work. It's uh, it was very useful. Thank in, you. Uh, in thinking this through. We have we I mean we have a good ten minutes. Um, mm -hmm. I mean if people if people have to have dinner or something they can leave. So if if, if you do want to ask a question, you're totally yeah. welcome to. Yeah, I mean I, it was more of a comment really. I mean because I mean as Bill knows like our kind of this sort of work is really kind of closely tied to what I do and just going to speak a bit more or ask if you could speak a bit more about the sort of oh. the difficulties that are associated with this, like the idea that um, these sort of uh, 
music theory instruments, as you describe them, you know, if we look at, well, if we go back to like your article, for example, you know, where you're talking about those kind of media journalism pieces, so we can, you know, look at that in one way. And then you've got your Jacob Collier kind of doll breakdowns and so on. And it's interesting how those things, which are for very, very different audiences are still mm -hmm. kind of our object of study in this context. Do you know what I mean? The fact that those are, you know, that like Jacob Collier's kind of status as a music theorist um, is almost as important as his status as a musician. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, he's all, often sort of spoke about in with those things like in mind anyway I, I don't really know where i'm going with that as i say i could just i could just talk to you forever it's just obviously this is fascinating and it's more interesting that these things these music theory instruments that are perhaps the object of our study while they fit into like you know this music digital subculture this thing that i um spoke about they also have a broader reach that isn't for that audience if that makes any sense they serve the, yeah. the real purpose sort mm -hmm. of you know like the got the Jacob Collier fans who are just watching it because it's Jacob Collier, mm -hmm. but then you've got these other people who are not really interested in Jacob Collier, but know that he's, uh -huh. you know, a theory buff. And uh -huh. I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm just rambling at this point, but there you go. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right about, um, you know, it was, it was funny. I, I mentioned John's thesis a little bit ago, and he wrote a thesis about uh, this concept called negative harmony, which is a sort of, ex, a sort of obscure music theoretical concept that, um, essentially Jacob Collier plucked out of obscurity and said it was interesting and it became this sort of internet meme, this idea that this music digital subculture was really interested in for a time. Um, and it was not something I was aware of at the time, but I, I don't think I've gotten the chance to tell you this, John, since you sent me the thesis, that um, it was right when I started teaching, right when I had finished graduate school and maybe my first year on the job two or three years ago, um, some of my students were talking about negative harmony. And I had, you know, it's like, oh, it, sound, it sounds German. It sounds, you know, like some kind of, uh, you know, dualist or, you know, some kind of wacky speculative theory, but I don't know anything about it. And uh, that episode just kind of sat dormant at the back of my mind for a couple of years. And then you, turns out, have written this wonderful study of this, this process that I think is, is uh, increasingly happening among our students, which is that they, the students who show up in my music theory classroom, have already been introduced to some of these things because they are, you know, kind of as as nerdy music fans have been watching Jacob Collier or have been watching, you know, Adam Neely and have been hearing a little snippets of like, here's a 10 minutes, here's 10 minutes about this. And so sometimes I know we talked about this in the panel a month or two ago that I'll bring something up and the students have already heard about it. They already know a little bit. Um, and so sort of in this way that Lucia said, um, that the academic and the, the non-academic spaces are coming together, part of that happens through our students, not only just through the things that we as, as uh, you know, some faculty who have an interest in this space make those connections, but our students are making those connections all the time. Um, that they, they are, you know, subscribing to these videos, seeing them, you know, before they come to our classes and before they encounter a given uh, topic in our lectures, they have some of them at least have already heard about it um, online. And so dealing with this and understanding how it works and you know, sort of engaging with it, I think is increasingly important because it's, uh, it's, another, it's another voice that your students are getting in their musical studies um, for many of us. And just to kind of follow on from that in the, you know, the panel that we were involved in in that conference a month or so ago, like, you know, it was full of, you know, undergraduate students more so than a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of other conferences typically would be. And especially, you know, obviously from, you know, my institution, you know, there was a lot there. But if, you know, as I was going through the, you know, the Google forms of all the, all the delegates, there was a mm -hmm. huge amount of people who were, mm -hmm. um just uh, not even like uh, higher, not non-academic musicians, basically, um, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of fans of Neely or whatever, who are all of a sudden find themselves now at an academic conference because yeah. of YouTube and stuff. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it is, it is bizarre, as you say, it's kind of, you know, kind of wonderful, but also kind of a strange, uh, strangely, a strangely vertiginous thing to realize that like music theory for your students is this completely separate thing, you know, from what kind of we tend to think that it is. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly how to theorize that, but there's some, you know, there's some theorization to be made that, uh, you know, academia holds a certain amount of, of cultural prestige, but that also on this very, very non-academic side of things has more cultural currency um, or cultural capital maybe with our students, with the 18 and 19 year olds. Um, that's music theory to them. And you're, you know, some jerk at the front of a lecture hall who's, uh, you know, trying to get them to do species counterpoint. Well, I think you've also made the point in the past that the sort of divide between both worlds can mm -hmm. be productive. Mm -hmm. um, and so perhaps like, well, not necessarily a negative thing, but mm -hmm. that that sort of opportunity, that window of opportunity of um, borrowing from one another is sort of yeah. the vision. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's a, I think it's an opportunity that you sort of have to take and that you sort of have to there's a little bit of it, it feels almost parental, you know, and sort of a lot of this is good, but occasionally, as I've, as I've written about, as I've criticized, you find people who want to wield music theory like a cudgel and say, well, you know, you can't do that, or, you know, this song is bad, this music is bad, music theory tells me so, um, you know, and, and I think that that is something that when it occasionally pops up, and the, the people we've been talking about are very good about not um, falling into those traps. You know, Adam Neely is never talking about this song is good because of this theoretical concept. Um, but that is something that sometimes pops up among, uh, among shall we say, enthusiasts um, that I think is something you sort of have to counteract. You have to say that, no, you know, it's the, the proper way to sort of engage with music theory is not to say that it is this immutable rule set that tells me this is good and this is bad. It's a, it's a way of talking about what is interesting in music or talking about what you find in music um, without them turning it towards value judgment necessarily. Okay, well, I think we do now have to end the session. Thank you yeah. all for being here, um, especially thank, thanks to you, Will. And thank you for having me. Um, I think that's all, Lillian, does you want to say something? No, I just want to say thank you as well. And uh, yeah, this was really great for me as a you know, non-music theorist. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you everyone for having me. Thank you for your wonderful questions and, uh, and discussion. This was a really a great time. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful night. Mm -hmm.